All right, new week. Um, excited for the opportunity to go to College Station, one of the great venues in all of college football. Um, uh, so looking forward to the trip out there. Got a big challenge. Uh, Coach Fisher, ton of respect for him and his staff. This is uh, an extremely well-coached team and an extremely talented team. They are uh, dangerous in all three phases. Um, you know, special teams-wise, every time we kick uh, is a, a, a challenge for us. Obviously, they've got dangerous returners uh, when we punt and then dangerous returners when we kick off as well. So we've got to do a great job covering. They've already, uh, I think the punt returner is averaging over 20 yards of return, already has a touchdown this season. He's a weapon anytime he touches uh, the ball. Um, their defense uh, front seven is scary good uh, all across the board. Obviously, I mean, they're all top, you know, five-star recruits, essentially. Uh, linebackers are active, 45 is all over the field for them. Cooper uh, leads the SEC in tackles for loss, I believe. He's fourth in sacks. Uh, he, we, we've got to account for him every single play along with the defensive line and then the secondary. Big, long uh, transfer from Boston College that's playing corner for him. Really good player. And, uh, you know, you look at statistically in the SEC, uh, defensive statistics, they're right at the top in pretty much everything. Uh, offensively, talented receivers, uh, running backs. They got three guys that are all, you know, elite speed, change of pace guys that can also run with great physicality. Offensive line is, is big and athletic. Uh, quarterback, got a lot of respect for um, Max Johnson and his entire family. Got to know his brother Jake and the family. We were recruiting him as a tight end at Oklahoma, so think the world of – their family and really impressed with Max and what he's doing. He's not a backup quarterback that's playing for him. He was a starting quarterback at LSU and came to Texas, uh, came to College Station and and uh, showing what a capable quarterback he is now that he's gotten the opportunity to start uh, with the injury to the previous quarterback, Connor. Uh, but really impressed with Max and his toughness sitting in the pocket. He's taking some shots, but he sits in there. He takes the hit and delivers a throw um, and then his brother obviously is a fantastic tight end we were recruiting him like crazy at Oklahoma during COVID so spent a lot of time with him on FaceTime and things like that during during that time also and then the other tight end 42 is a really good player for him so veteran team extremely talented team very well coached team have had a couple tough losses here in the SEC that were you know essentially came, both games came down late in the fourth quarter so we'll have to play well and Excited about the opportunity, like I said, in a great venue. Injury-wise, Juice won't play. I'd say Amari and Brown is doubtful. And then literally every single other person that you're going to ask me about is questionable. They were all out there today. They all were not full speed necessarily. They were all limited in their own way. Uh, but hopefully as we go throughout the week, they'll get closer and closer to being um, close to 100% and able to play one game day. Questions? You communications class guys, David always gets the first question over here. So write that down in your notes also as far as what you learned in, in the press conference. Uh, Shane, a couple for you, um, like a few for you. Um, with Juice, will he be back this year, do you know, at this point? I think there's a chance. Um, I think if you – I don't want to speak for Juice. I think if you – uh, if you ask Juice, I think he would tell you he would like to come back and play at some point this season. Uh, he's a competitor. He wants to be out there. He's in every meeting. He's engaged. He's talking. Uh, he's working like crazy to be able to get back. And then from an outside perspective, i.e. a fan perspective, you get a lot of injuries. You know, folks start saying, what's going on with the strength coach and the mm -hmm. strength program? What do you? How do you respond to that? And also, have you guys started considering some changes in the ways you do things like nutrition and just trying to get past this injury? But yeah, no, great question. I think you said you had a few. Is there one more coming after that too? All right, we'll get to. Um, uh, yeah, I was talking with Mo Kaba this morning. He and I were texting back and forth about something, and then obviously saw him in our meeting. Um, you know. To, He's in good spirits, and, you know, we'll see what the future holds for him as well. You know, hate it for him that he's not playing right now, along with all of our injured guys, you know. Um, they all love football and love love to play, and it's tough not getting to see – not being able to. So my heart breaks uh, for them. Yeah, you're constantly looking at everything that you're doing, coaching, um, X's and O's, uh, schedule, how we practice, how we travel, what we do on Fridays, uh, what we do in spring practice. You're always – as the head coach, looking at how can we be better um, in in every area, and certainly, uh, you know, so it's certainly it's 
concerning when you have that many injuries at one position. I've never in all my years of coaching been around a year where you've had that many injuries at one position, but it's not like you can just point your finger at it either. You know, I mean, Case and Henry got rolled up on um, against UNC. It doesn't matter how you train, practice, lift weights, whatever. It's going to happen. Um, uh, some of the other injuries, it is what it is. So you don't – I don't think you make too big a deal out of it, but you do analyze and look at everything that you're doing year to year. And we always tweak, David, based on, you know, the year before and how we can be better. And that's in nutrition and that's in the training room and that's in the weight room. And that is it's, uh, in coaching everything. So certainly it's my job as the head coach to always, you know, look at how we do things and how we can be better without a doubt. But got great confidence and belief in everybody that's in this building and and the roles they're responsible for, but we all, we're two and five, we all, starting with me, have to do them better than what we're doing them right now. Shane, you've often said in the past, you know, you want this program to be player-led, and you talked about after the game the other day, just talking to some of the upperclassmen, how important, mm -hmm. we're talking about the story of this season and how these next couple <laughs> of weeks are going to be played out. What does that look like based on some of the teams you've been a part of, whether it be as a player, whether it be on coaching staffs, when you do go through a funk like this, but you still have a good part of the season still ahead of you yeah I think it's making sure our guys realize that you know what all is still out there for them to attain like we we had high expectations going into this season and and um, a lot of the goals that we have had at the beginning of the season aren't attainable but a lot of the goals that these seniors had at the beginning of the season are still very much attainable and um you know not getting caught up so much and I, I get it we're, we're judged on the record but let's not get so caught up in we're two and five or two and five and, and lose sight of the things we have to be grateful for around here as well. And we get to play a game and coach a game that we love and all that as well. So that I think communication is critical during this time, uh, player to coach, coach to player, player to player. And uh, that's what I told those leaders also, like they all hurt. They, they, these seniors, the carry on joiner who's given so much to this university did not come back this season to be sitting here at two and five. But, you know, like I've told these seniors, this is your team and and uh, uh, whatever you want to get done, you need to communicate that. And it's on you guys. So we've empowered you as leaders. And uh, now what are you going to do with it? And I've seen great signs of that with those guys communicating with one another. Um, you know, throughout the week, at practice, uh, with their work ethic, things like that as well. So like I've told you guys all along, we, we got great young men in this program. And if I felt – it'd be one thing if I woke up on Sunday mornings or you really don't wake up because you're already asleep on Saturday night after a loss. But when I get out of bed and come into the facility, if I came in here like – Oh, God, like I got to go deal with these guys again today. That's not the way I feel. Like even after a brutal loss on Saturday, gut-wrenching loss on Saturday before, I come in here on Sunday and I can't wait to, for the players to come into the building at 3 o'clock on Sundays and be around them. And that's the truth. So we got good good young men. We got good people in this program. Uh, we got good leadership in this on this team. We all need to be better, but we got a lot of football left. And, and uh, let's make sure we appreciate being around one another day in, day out too. Shane, I do have a, a, a couple for you. Um, you mentioned A&M and Sacks. There are a lot of SEC teams. Sacks seems to be up in a lot of areas. What do you see? Is that a function of the defensive players that are that you're having to go against? Is it offensive line play that maybe isn't as you know as good as it's been? What do you what do you see from that? That is a great question, and it really is because I thought the same thing myself the other day. I was looking at stats in. SEC games only, and you see the amount of sacks that these guys have in just SEC games, and you're like, holy mackerel, <laughs> um, on that as well. But it's it's not just – I mean, and we've given up way too many in SEC games, but then you see some of the other teams around us that have given up a lot of sacks as well. Um, I wish I had a great answer for you. It is great. It is a great question. I think it's a – it's a um, to me, it's a couple things – I know Texas A&M, they're starting a true freshman at offensive tackle. We are starting two true freshmen on the offensive line. Uh, so I do think there's some teams in this league that are starting freshmen in key positions, and there's no doubt about it in my mind. It's harder – the hardest thing to do as a true freshman is to play on the line of scrimmage, particularly in the offensive line. Not that going out there and playing receiver or DB is easy, but I've always believed this, that the farther away you are from the ball, it's a little bit easier to play – as a freshman from a physical standpoint, you know, we got 
true freshmen in there and you're blocking 300 pound grown men on the other side that are going to be first round draft picks like last week at Missouri and like this week at Texas A&M for us. Uh, so I think you've got some offensive lines in this league that had some have some youth. You're playing some very, very talented defensive lines. People can talk about what's the difference in the SEC and the different conferences across the country. The defensive line is one of them. And no matter what anybody says, you can't argue with that. I mean, you just look at the defense alignment in this league and it's a who's who of guys that are going to be playing in the NFL in the next three years. And, uh, and then I think also defenses are, are very multiple. You know, there's no defense that we play in this league that, okay, they're going to line up and four down and they're going to play three deep coverage and, all right, now go block them. I mean, you're playing teams and they're coming from everywhere. And uh, I think the multiplicity of defenses in this league, I think the talented of talented defense alignment in this league, um, and then some offensive lines that maybe quite aren't where they need to be, all kind of adds up. But I thought the same thing when I was looking at it yesterday. So, yeah. And well, your second question, sorry. See, I, I appreciate that. Maybe yeah. I could be a football coach. Someday. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Spencer has played at a consistently high level mm -hmm. this season. What's his attitude as things maybe haven't gone the way he envisioned uh, coming into this season? Um, couldn't be better. I mean, he's amazing. He really is. Um, he um, he got the crap beat out of him on Saturday. Never complained. Never once came over there. Was continuing to lift up his teammates. Was continuing to try and pick up the freshmen. Was in there battling to the very end. I feel for him because I talk about these seniors that come back. Same thing with him. I mean, he came back and he's playing his butt off right now. He didn't expect to be two and five. He didn't expect to, you know, have some of the injuries that we've had on the offensive line. But his his energy at practice, his demeanor within the team goes back to Mike's question about leadership. Be, be like leadership. Be like Spencer and how he is handling his teammates, and then just his unselfishness. Like he he um, I got on the plane Saturday before he did, and I was sitting on the aisle. Uh, not feeling good about myself or anything, waiting on everybody else to board. And he came by me and stopped and put his hand on my shoulder and apologized to me that they weren't able to get it done on Saturday. And I'm like, bro, like I should be apologizing to you. I mean, you're the one that just got beat up out there and we didn't, I didn't coach well enough for you. But that's just, it's not fake. That's how he is. And that's the way he always has been and couldn't be prouder of him. There's not another quarterback in the country I'd rather have than him leading this team. And he's got a, a great future in these next five games. There's still some great moments coming for him as a quarterback. And then he's got a great future as a quarterback after he leaves here at Carolina as well. You talked about leaning on young guys in key positions. How have you seen them, especially with all these injuries that are happening now these last couple of days, stepping up to that challenge, now headed into a really tough atmosphere and trying to get this offense especially back into the end zone? Yeah, um, I, the, the young guys stepping up in general, you're saying, I think they've done a great job of it. Um, they continue to, you know, you say, oh, you're not a freshman anymore. I mean, these guys have now played – seven as seven games against really good competition so they they know what to expect and they've been in tough environments and and we talked about it uh this morning in our team meeting that going to college station i mean it's another great environment that we get to go to like this is why you i know it's cliche but it's why you come play in the sec so you can go into stadiums where there's a hundred thousand people in the stands and and all that as well and i continue to see those guys just uh, get better, but also gain more and more confidence. You know, that's the one cool thing about this freshman class is I've never – the ones that are playing a lot of snaps. You know, you could argue uh, Nick obviously played six, close to 60 plays on Saturday, Nicholas Harbor. So you could argue he's like a starting receiver now. So if you count him, you count Kilgore, you know, Judge Collier is our third corner, which he's basically a starter if you're our third corner. Tree, Tro, I mean, was that like five true freshmen that you're starting? But none of those guys – have I ever felt like, oh, my God, like this moment's too big for them? Not one time. And um, that's a credit to them and their families and their background. Now, do they need to uh, perform better at times? Sure. Do we need to help them do that at times? Absolutely. But, you know, you don't worry about them because they, um, they're they great young men and, and the moment hasn't been too big for them at any point, you know, this season. And this is obviously our last road game coming up, and this is another rocking environment that we're going to go to. Uh, but it's one of the great venues in college football, and it's a great opportunity for them to go up out, go out there and compete against a really good team. 
to go back to Spencer, I mean, with potentially all three of your starting receivers out and all the injuries on the line, does it change anything with how you have him protect himself in the pocket and things like that? Does it have to change things schematically for you guys, you know, going forward here? Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, I know it, <laughs> it didn't look like it on Saturday, but we tried to last Saturday. Um, I mean, we tried to get the ball out of his hands uh, quicker. We tried to move the pocket. We threw some. We threw a couple of screens to running backs um, as well, just to try and slow down the pass rush. We, you know, double teamed people and things like that. And I said it on the teleconference um, Sunday night that, you know, when I turned on the tape, you expected to see like just Missouri guy after Missouri guy just running through our offensive linemen, and it wasn't necessarily that. It was just. One play, it might be the right tackle. One play, it might be the tight end. One play, it might be the quarterback. One play, it might be the center. One play, it might be the left guard, the running back, the receiver, the left tackle, whoever it might be. We all had a hand in it from a protection standpoint. But, yes, to answer your question, we tried to do that last week. We obviously, as coaches, didn't do a good enough job of of um, trying to design ways to help Spencer. But at some point, too, like, you got to do your job. And at some point, you got to be able to protect. And our five, our five offensive linemen, they're on scholarship, too. And they need to be able to – uh, get it done. We recruited them here to South Carolina for a reason. Uh, they're really good players. Uh, we beat other schools for a lot of these guys as well because they're really good players, and we have confidence in them as well. So, yes, we're going to help Spencer also. We can't ask him – the other thing is being able to run the ball. We can't ask him to throw the ball 40 times like he did against Missouri, and we can't sit back there and ask him to be in true drop-back six-man protection for 40 times. But we have to be able to do that some, whether it's five-man protection and we're free release of the back or we're an empty – or whether it's max protection, we got to be able to mix it up and certainly help him, uh, particularly with the, you know, the defensive line uh, that we faced last week, we'll face this week, and that we'll see as the year goes on. Also, hey Shane, when you look at all the injuries and in practice, what's the biggest challenge when it comes to getting the biggest benefits out of practice? And also, you mentioned you're going on the road for the last time. Yep. Uh, have Have you thought about changing up your routine on the road or? Anything? Yeah. Um, as far as practice, biggest challenge is just being able to get um, the physical work that you need. You know, as a as a head coach, I struggle with it. Um, just it's, it, or I think about it a lot. Just what we do in practice, and yes, we need we need the good on good work, which we did some of that today. Ones versus ones, and good on good, and let's go play ball. We did a lot of that today, and but you got to be smart with how much you're doing it. And then probably the biggest challenge, so that's one, is just balancing how much you do it. And then to me, probably the biggest challenge is it's, we, you guys have heard me say it before, we don't do a ton of scout team work, meaning, okay, you guys that are red shirting, y'all go over there and emulate or simulate the uh, Texas A&M offense against our starting defense. And then you guys that are red shirting are not playing much on our defense. You guys are going to be the Texas A&M defense against the South Carolina offense. We don't do a ton of that, but you've got to do some of it to be able to prepare for the week. And when you're down on linemen like we are, it's really impossible to do that because you've got to have enough linemen over there with the offense to do what you need to do from an offensive standpoint, which you're taking guys that are typically maybe over there on the scout team. So today, for example, our left guard and our left tackle on the scout team were uh, Lucas Vose and Cam Sandlin. They're tight ends. And they're playing left guard and left tackle, trying to you know show Tonka and Boogie and those guys what it's going to be like on Saturday. And they're doing a great job, but they're not offensive linemen, so that's the biggest challenge. Uh, and then as far as going on the road, you always look at it. You know, we may do some things on Friday just to kind of tweak things a little bit. It'd be one thing um, if I felt like we were just, um, you know, two years ago we had some first quarters where we got the crap kicked out of us from like the jump. That's not happening right now. You know, Georgia, we were up 14-3 to three at the half. Tennessee, we were leading after the first quarter. Um, uh, Missouri, we got a three and out. We went down the field and had a chance to score and didn't get points, and then we'll see what happens Saturday. So I think it's a little bit different than what it was two years ago. We're starting games on the road in hostile environments better, but obviously we're not playing well enough. We didn't show up to Columbia or show up to Athens to play a good first quarter, first half. We got to figure out how to put four quarters together. So like David asked, you're always looking at like routines, but to me it starts more in how you're practicing and what you're doing throughout the week. 
But yeah, with it being our last one and we haven't won, won a road game yet, we'll certainly, you know, look, is there a better way of doing things and, and may tweak some things with the schedule on Friday. Trey Knox was in here earlier talking about how it feels like some of the younger players are trying to be too perfect all the time in practice. Um, as a coach, how do you balance maybe trying to improve technique and stability, but also understanding that guys just can't be perfect, like Trey was saying? I think uh, whether it's a freshman, sophomore, junior, senior, to me as a coach, you never want them worried about making a mistake and trying to be so perfect. Um, I'm far from a great golfer. But when I'm on the golf course, if I'm standing over with my seven iron and I'm like, please don't shank this, please don't shank this, don't screw up, I'm probably going to shank it or screw up. And it's the same thing if you're a freshman receiver or senior quarterback. And I think it goes back to what we were talking about with our freshmen. They're great young men, and they want to please, and they want to um, – they're so appreciative and grateful. Like Mick, Nick Harbour walked in my office Sunday night – and thank me for I know I told you guys the story after he scored the touchdown against Furman, and then he comes in my office and thanks me the other night for trusting him to play 57 plays in the game on Saturday. That's just like the that's the group that's the young men that we have on this team, and they want to please and they want to do well, uh, and they don't want to let us down. They don't want to let their teammates down, like the seniors. But it's also you know our our older guys they know this. Like they're gonna these guys are gonna make mistakes, and as long as you're working hard. And um, and putting forth the effort, we can live with the mistakes. And that's what we've tried to convey to those guys, too, that you're going to make mistakes. I'm going to make mistakes. I do every game. I do every day. and uh, But do it just with great effort. And that's why our players have so much respect for Nick Harbour, for example, because they see him every day before practice. He's out there catching footballs before practice even starts or catching tennis balls for, like, ball drill stuff. And um, they see him after practice get extra work with – Liette and some of those guys so they see the the ex the uh, work that these guys put in and and that's why there's great respect for those young guys and then those young guys know that that we have their backs and as long as they're working hard and putting forth the effort you know we can live with the mistakes hey Shane so when you're in these fourth down situations whether it's at midfield or when you're driving down the field what kind of goes into your decision making is it something that just comes down to the confidence and the play calling to get the right playoff the momentum the offense is kind of building or is it just like the time in the game what's kind of your thought process when you're in those spots yeah um I think it's a little bit of all of that um how you're playing offensively how you're playing defensively how you're playing special teams you know, I've told you guys before, you know, I've watched literally every play of offense, defense, and special teams going into a game that our opponent does. So I have an idea of what the other team's offense is and defense and special teams, and that helps me with the decision-making, and I'm far from perfect from that standpoint. But, uh, you know, there's some coaches that, you know, they, they're – 100% analytics driven and they're going to go, they're going to go by the book and if the book says if you hit the 30 yard line it's fourth and five or less go for it I don't that's you know we, we rely on analytics to a certain degree but not as far as making every decision in the game I don't do that uh, it's more of a feel and and each situation is is uh is different um you know, I know I've been criticized for kicking the field goal inside the five yard line the other day and to me that was one where um, I felt like we had three pretty good calls on first down that we uh, first down, second down, third down that um, we didn't do a great job of executing mentally. And it's, in my mind, it was like we've had three plays to get this thing in. We've had three pretty good play calls and we didn't execute them properly. Not that I don't have confidence in our guys on fourth down to get it done, but also let's let's get points and keep it a two score game. You know, that was the thinking on that one. The the fourth down, I think I told you guys in the post game press conference, uh the first fourth down of the game where we missed the field goal. Initially I was gonna punt. Initially we're in field goal range, so it was hey, we're in field goal range, let's be smart with the ball here, and it's an automatic three, and then we took the sack. So then at that point, my initially I was gonna punt. And then, uh, you know, let the play clock run down and call timeout because the wind was swirling and wanted to see what the wind was going to do because certainly we were in Mitch's range at that point and felt like we could get three points there. Uh, probably the start of the timeout was going to punt. We had the punt team and field goal both up. The wind kind of flipped a little bit. We had it at the back and, and kicked the field goal there and missed. But uh, the fourth downs that I've gone for, you know, I can remember 
two years ago against Kentucky at home, we went just for two fourth downs that we didn't get in plus territory instead of kicking field goals. And then we lose by six and it's easy for everybody to say, well, dang it, if he kicked those two field goals, we would have gone to overtime. But that was a situation. I just felt like um, in the game at that time, we needed, we had an opportunity to get it. So it goes back to how you're playing. It goes back to the play calls that we know that I know we're going to call on fourth down going forward on some fourth downs against Tennessee last year, you know, knowing it's going to be a high scoring game. So I think every game is, is different, but a lot of those things that we, we discussed me, Dow, Clayton, Pete before the game also at the hotel, kind of how we're going to coach this game. And, and um, you know, this week, for example, you know, I mean, these guys, when we kick a field goal, it's you better hold on for dear life. Cause they've, this defensive line I'm talking about, they do a hell of a job blocking field goals too, you know? So, or do you want to punt and punt the ball down there to number zero all those times as well? So I know that's like a whole different press conference, whole different thing that I just gave you for one answer, but it's uh it's a lot that goes into it. Sorry. I should have just said, I go by analytics and I go by what the book tells me and then we move on. <laughs> and y'all could have gotten like six more questions in by now. Sorry. Huh? No, I'm good. Uh, <laughs> I need to sit down is what I need. <laughs> uh, last week you kind of alluded to it, but anytime a team is on a slide like y'all are on, folks on the outside, worry about the current recruiting class and uh -huh. what they're talking about, what the reception has been like with those guys. So what's sort of what you guys are hearing from, from those guys and how you feel about them? Everything's been great. You know, usually after games I uh, – uh, Usually after games, my wife wasn't at the game Saturday in Missouri, and so she was probably the first person that sent me a text. I always get a phone call from my mom, win or lose, and then without a doubt, within the first three people I hear, I hear from is always a certain quarterback that's committed to us, like before the game's even over, I think. I get a text from him. Um, so it's been positive. I think those guys realize, you know, how close we are, and, and we talk to them every week. I mean, we – we're on the phone with recruits. I was on the phone with a recruit last night late in my office. And Wednesday nights, we sit up here as a staff and just talk FaceTime recruits for an hour as a staff. And, and uh, you know, they've been good. I get it. It's a long time to sign in day. But those guys, uh, a lot of them have been at – they were at the Florida game two weeks ago, and they saw, you know, how that game went. And they know, you know, some of the issues that we have right now. They see the young players that are out there playing. And I think the message that I've gotten from all of uh, – all of the recruiting class is how excited they are to get here to start helping, um, helping us on the field as well. Coach, you mentioned it earlier how you felt like your freshmen, you know, have been big enough for the moment so far. Mm -hmm. I wanted to ask how how much does that impress you, and then two, does that give you any confidence that you guys are recruiting the right kind of players to play for this program? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I knew you get to know these guys in recruiting certainly and and this is probably the class that I knew best once they signed because this was a class that we spent a couple years you know recruiting and, and I was able to um, go into Nicholas Harbor's home and go into Jalen Kilgore's home and and Desmond's home and on and on and on and on and on and get to know their families through a couple years of recruiting them so you feel pretty good about the people that you're that you're bringing into their your program, getting to know their families. Then I had a really good idea that, okay, we got the right people in here. And I think I've said it before when they got here in January and they had the semester that they had academically. I mean, they were lights out from an academic standpoint and still are. You know, last spring semester was the highest GPA we've ever had here as a football team. And a lot of that was because of our freshmen coming in and doing a great job. So I knew we had the right kind of people, but you don't really know on the field until you start playing games. Um, how they're going to react to that environment. But, you know, North Carolina game when Jalen Kilgore is in the game on like the third play of the game or whatever it was and, and did great and has continued to do great, you say, okay, we got the right people. And, you know, I wish that guys like Marquis were healthy and playing. But, you know, this whole class, it's just it's, – it's great young men. I enjoy being around them, you know, whether it's Lenoris or, you know, Marquis or, or all these guys. I mean, the guys on defense, they're just – they work hard. And, and, uh, and don't get me wrong, I mean, there's freshmen. They're still – got to – put your arm around them really tight some days and, and uh, talk to them about certain things. They're learning and growing like all college freshmen are, but, uh, but uh, they're, they're, they're good young men. You know, Derek Moore, Demo, he meets with the freshmen every Monday morning and I usually pop my head in there on them and it's a, that was in there yesterday with them and they're, uh, they're good young men and they're excited about, you know, the future here at Carolina. 
So kind of going back to this road game this week, this is the last one. Is there any sort of sense of relief that after this weekend you're done, you get to worry about playing in Williams Bryce the rest of the year, or is it just like we're not even going to acknowledge that moment until after Saturday? Yeah, I think it's not even you don't even acknowledge it until after Saturday. Um, for me, it's another opportunity as a competitor. You know, what more could you want as a competitor going on the road on national television in an awesome environment? That's all we're focused on. And certainly our guys are aware. We talked about it earlier in the season that, look, our you know we got a tough schedule these first seven games, our first eight games away from home. But then we come back and we got four home games in Columbia in November. But, you know, right now it's it's the mindset of, what do we have to do to go play really well on Saturday out in College Station? And, and let's focus on that. And, you know, we know what's after that, but it's not a let's get through this week and whew, take a breath. Hard, far from it because we got four really good teams coming in here in November. Uh, right now, the mindset is, you know, what do we have to do the rest of Tuesday, you know, to put ourselves in position to go play, perform well and coach well on, on uh, Saturday? Uh, I guess I'll. I'll Two, if possible, if not, uh, first yeah, many as you want. So, <laughs> uh, keeps me from having to go watch their third down defense as soon as I walk out of here. The first one you've mentioned so much about trying to figure out how to practice when you have all these injuries, uh -huh. and I've heard of you know other college coaches trying to use sometimes the the portal to just get offensive line depth to anticipate this. But you're talking about hey, the NFL's only got 53 guys, and yeah. somehow they figure it out. Have have you spent this last week or these last couple of weeks calling around to different people who have maybe encountered this or NFL contacts of like, all right, how do you guys figure this out? Yeah. Um, Y'all are like on like a whole different, like what, like my wavelength today. It's really weird. So you have a question that I was already thinking about. And, and yes, I did that, you know, yesterday talked to called two NFL head coaches that, that I've got good relationships with that are head coaches in the NFL and just talk to them, you know, about that because you do have a smaller roster and managing the roster, num managing the roster when you do have that many people. But then also too, Jordan, like we got a lot of coaches on our staff that have spent time in the NFL, you know, either as a player or coach. So you can kind of talk to them uh, also, but certainly, you know, pick the brains of a couple NFL coaches that I respect um, yesterday. I won't tell you who, but they're in, they're both in the AFC. So you can narrow it down to, would that be 16 teams? Um, uh, as well, so that was that was beneficial. Just kind of picking their brain on some things, and then yeah, yesterday I you know reached out to. Um, uh, I'm always trying to. You don't have a lot of time to talk to people, but certainly reaching out to people. Talked to Don Staley, you know, yesterday for a while about some stuff, and not necessarily how to practice the offensive line. She can't help me with that, but certainly other things, and then you know, uh, some coaches that I have relationships with, just picking their brains on on you know, always just ideas and bouncing things off of them. But specifically with the practice part of it, yeah, absolutely. Um, because they have half the roster size that we do. And, and the practices are a little bit different in the NFL. Uh, I get it. But because um, they have them from – there's no four-hour rule in the NFL in regards to how many hours we can have them in the building. So we got a lot that we have to pack in and the four hours we're allowed. But you can always learn from, from some of them from that standpoint. And lastly, uh, you know, obviously the, the receivers injuries, guys are going to have to step up. You mentioned Nick Harbour, but on Sunday you kind of said Omega Blake is doing a better job making sure his life is in order off the field. How have you seen him mature off the field over the last year? I think just the work that he's putting in um, on football, not that he wasn't doing it before, but uh, he's um, – he is uh, putting in the work to try and learn the game plan each week and putting in the work on the practice field, just doing extra throughout the week. That's what, that's what I've seen. And, and please, don't under, or don't, please don't interpret that as saying that he was bad off the field. I think he's – because he wasn't. Uh, he's not a guy that's in trouble and, and showing up on lists all the time. I think it's just more consistency from him day in, day out, you know, be the same person. And, you know, Omega's always been a talented guy. You weren't here two years ago, but Omega played in the bowl game with for us in the, bowl, in, in the Mayo Bowl. I mean, we tried to throw like a reverse pass to with him where he was – guy that was going to throw the ball against UNC and I think we got hit for like a 10-yard loss but it's a good try um but we used him in the bowl game a couple of years ago so he's always been talented um and uh you know he's just gotten more consistent off the field and it's important to him and and you know some of the players see that too because they know that he's he's putting in the work to um learn and put himself in the best position to be successful each Saturday at all all right thank you Thanks for coming, class.